We begin with one of the world's greatest Christian legal scholars at work today, Professor Marianne Glendon, who is going to be serving as our opening keynote, McDonald Distinguished Christian Scholars Lecturer. Professor Glendon is the learned hand professor of law at Harvard Law School. She is the former United States Ambassador for Religious Freedom uh, in the Vatican. She currently serves as a commissioner on the United States Commission for International Freedom, and she has just stepped down from a number of years of service in the Institute for uh, Religious Works uh, that supervises the work of the Vatican Bank. She is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, of the International Com Academy of Comparative Law uh, and the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences, which she served with distinction as president uh, for more than a decade. She served two terms on the United States President's Council on Bioethics, and she has represented the United States government and the Holy See in a variety of causes and conferences around the world on fundamental questions of law, politics, religion, and society. But we know her especially in the legal academy as a brilliant legal scholar who has produced pathbreaking work in a number of distinct fields of study. Some of us know her for her early work on family law, where she wrote award-winning titles on abortion and divorce in Western law, the transformation of family law, and a number of other texts and essays, especially in recent years in sober and deep critique of the sexual and divorce revolution and its fallout for church, state, and society. Some of us know her for her comparative law work, for her leading casebook and textbooks in the field, and for her recent work leading the Pontifical Academy, dealing with comparative questions of ecology and children and youth, the environment, and more. Some of us know her for her work in legal and political theory and legal education, captured in such titles as The Forum and the Tower, and a nation under lawyers. All of us after today will know her for her brilliant work on human rights and religious freedom, where she has mined the deep foundations of human rights and religious freedom uh, in human nature, in human society, in the organization of a good life and of a good society for all, and also the necessary limitations of human rights and religious freedom norms in a world populated by many other forms of fundamental discourse. All of you will be rushing to the bookstore to buy her recent book, A World Made New, Eleanor Roosevelt and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And while you're there, you might as well buy her last path-breaking book in the field, Rights Talk, The Impoverishment of Political Discourse. It is a great privilege to be able to have as our opening distinguished McDonald Scholars Lecture the keynote of this conference, my friend, my colleague, uh, and my teacher, Professor Mary Ann Glendon. Please join me in robust applause. Well, thank you very much, John, for that extremely generous introduction. Uh, I'm truly honored to have been invited to give this introduction to what I am sure is going to be a very fruitful, beneficial conference on the current status of religious freedom. Um, while I'm honored, I must admit that the invitation from Nigel Bigger and John Woody presented me with something of a dilemma because you see, four years ago, almost exactly four years ago, I was invited to give a talk uh, for the Oxford Summer Academy on uh, law and religion, and uh, it was on the very same topic. So you can see that I had to devote quite a bit of attention to how I would avoid repeating myself. I began to feel like the little old lady who went to confession. She told the priest that 40 years ago she had committed a terrible sin against chastity, and the priest naturally said, well, haven't you confessed this before? And she said, oh, yes, Father, but I just love talking about it. <laughs> uh, well, in my case, uh, looking back on what I said four years ago, uh, it strikes me now as a very gloomy talk. I think you heard a version of that gloomy talk, uh, John, at Emory one time. And um, so 
I, I do want to say something more positive this time. There have been quite a few developments in the past four years, some positive and some negative. I wish I could say that I thought the overall picture of the status of religious freedom had improved, but uh, for me, the title of this conference, Is Religious Freedom Under Threat?, sounds a little bit like the rhetorical, does the Pope go to Mass on Sunday? Uh, or other versions of that that you probably have heard. So uh, let's not deceive ourselves, however. Uh, many of you here may think that that's a rhetorical question, but for many of our friends and fellow citizens and colleagues, um, the answer is no. Religious freedom is not under threat. In fact, a recent poll in the United States specifically asked that question, and 56% of the American respondents said, no, religious freedom is not under threat. And even more striking is many people would answer that question with religious freedom itself is a threat. At least that seems to be the thrust of a European poll that uh, interrogated people from Great Britain, Germany, Sweden, and 60% uh, of the respondents in those countries said they believe religion does more harm than good. So this leads me to believe that one of the great threats to religious freedom right now is actually the widespread idea that religious freedom is not under threat. And if that is the case, if I'm right about that, then one of the most urgent challenges for religious freedom advocates, for defenders of religious freedom, is to make their case more effectively and more persuasively to a new generation. What, for example, are you going to say to this mysterious Generation Z that is coming along? So uh, I would like, what I'd like to do this evening is share some thoughts about the challenge, and I hope that I will hear yours because I am uh, in a state of perplexity about the answers to some of the questions that I'm going to raise. I guess I would say all of the questions I'm going to raise. Now, when I go to a lecture, especially a lecture in the afternoon before dinner, I like to have the speaker give me a little road map of where he or she is going so that uh, sometimes so I can tell how near they're getting to the end uh, or close to dinner. And uh, so uh, uh, here's my little road map. Uh, there'll be three parts to this talk. And the first part will be based on my experiences of four years with USERF, which is the term I'm going to use, the acronym for the US Commission on International Religious Freedom, uh, some thoughts about the challenges that face international religious freedom advocates. Then in the second part, uh, since the challenges for religious freedom advocates in what I hope we may still call the liberal democracies are quite different, in several respects, I'll turn briefly to some recent developments in Europe and the United States, and I will conclude third part with some thoughts about the problem that perplexes me most. How do we make the case for religious freedom in secularized, increasingly secularized societies to different kinds of audiences and in a world where that right is little valued, not only by militant secularists, not only by intolerant religious zealots, but also by increasing numbers of well-intentioned friends, colleagues, and fellow citizens. So, where international religious freedom is concerned, I'll start with a proposition that may seem obvious. Um, Given the massive amounts of evidence of severe, violent, systematic religious freedom violations in many parts of the world, it's easier to make the case, I think, in Europe and the United States for international religious freedom 
than it is when one is speaking of the less dramatic types of infringements that we see at home. This is not to say that it's easier to persuade our decision makers, our governments, to address atrocities abroad, just that it's easier to make the case. USERF issues an annual report every year about this time. Last year's report, 2017 report, began with the statement, and I'm quoting here, blatant assaults have become so frightening. Attempted genocide, the slaughter of innocents, wholesale destruction of places of worship, that less egregious abuses often go unnoticed. Then in this year's report, issued just a month ago, USERF says there has been a downward trend from that unhappy situation, including, and I quote, genocide and other mass atrocities, killings, enslavement, rape, imprisonment, forced displacement, forced conversions, intimidation, harassment, property destruction, marginalization of women, bans on children participating in religious activities or education, and add to that that some of the most populous countries in the world are among the worst violators so that, according to the Pew Research Center, almost 80%, 78% of the world's inhabitants live in countries where, to use to, uh, Pew's terminology, there are high or very high restrictions, both governmental and social, on religious freedom. By all indications, then, the world is an increasingly hostile place for religious individuals and groups, Christianity, Jews, Muslims, Baha'is, Yazidis, Hindus, Sikhs, and many others. Now, the situation is complicated. In many cases, it's difficult to discern the extent to which these very severe hostilities and restrictions are driven by religious considerations or by the ethnic and political factors with which religious considerations are so often entwined. Malise Ruthven has written well about this. But the impact on religious freedom is the same. Um, I have to mention, too, that currently Christians are, by all accounts, the principal targets of religiously motivated violence and oppression, with an estimated right now 150 million persons facing persecution, especially in Iran, Somalia, Syria, Pakistan, North Korea, and Nigeria. Obviously, the denial of a fundamental right is atrocious no matter what group or what persons are being attacked, but it is notable that the media tends to under-report the degree to which Christians are disproportionately affected. And sad to say, religious freedom violations of all types tend to be under-reported, and not only by the media, but by human rights organizations. So, for example, Human Rights Watch, one of the most important human rights organizations, has touched on religious persecution in only eight of 323 reports that it issued in a period of three and a half years. This sort of thing undoubtedly contributes to the widespread belief that religious freedom is not under threat. And that belief, in turn, may help to explain why in countries that generally pride themselves upon their commitment to human rights, their tradition of human rights, it so often proves difficult to get government officials to pay attention to the worst atrocities that are taking place around the world. I'm going to give you a couple of examples from my service on USERF. I'll begin just by saying that in 1998, the US Congress, by a nearly unanimous vote, passed an International Religious Freedom Act, which established as a foreign policy priority in the United States the defense of religious freedom abroad and the defense of individuals suffering persecution on account of their religion. So the priority was established 20 years ago. But 
for 20 years, many changes in the administration, a central administration, for many years the State Department has been, I, I'll put it as charitably as I can, has been very slow in accepting that priority. Um, many State Department representatives de deliberately avoid using the term religious freedom. They prefer instead freedom of worship, which I'm sure, as most of you know, seriously narrows down the scope of Article 18 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which speaks not only of freedom of worship, but freedom to manifest your religious beliefs alone or in community with others, in private and in public. Now, USERF, in its annual reports, has often called attention to this fact uh, that the term freedom of worship doesn't quite cut it. Uh, and USERF has also pointed out that using the term freedom of worship instead of freedom of religion sends an unfortunate signal because that is the very expression that is favored by government officials in countries that are notorious for religious freedom violations. For example, uh, when USERF visited, during my term on USERF, uh, we visited Pakistan, via, I was with, we visited many countries. I was with delegations that went to Pakistan, Vietnam, Turkey, and uh, in all of those places, we were repeatedly assured by government officials that there was freedom of worship in those countries and that their citizens enjoy religious freedom because they can believe what they like and go to services as they see fit. In Pakistan, interestingly, our first visit was a, a courtesy call, the first day it was a courtesy call to the U.S. Embassy. And there, a representative of the U.S. government said to us, oh, there is more freedom of worship in Pakistan than there is in any place in the Middle East. And uh, that was interesting because when we went then to see the Minister of the Interior and other such officials, they said, yes, more freedom of worship in Pakistan than in any place in the Middle East. It was as though they were singing from the same hymnal. But we soon learned from talking to many uh, religious leaders and uh, members of religious groups that even worship services in Pakistan were being heavily monitored. And two days after we left the country, two Christian churches were bombed in Lahore with 15 persons killed and 72 wounded. Similarly, in Vietnam, our delegation met with the US ambassador himself, who assured us there was great freedom of worship in Vietnam. But our meetings with religious groups and individuals told a very different story. A few days after we left Vietnam, several people who had come to talk to us and taken great risks to do so were arrested and jailed. It's not as though the US government and other governments don't have measures at their disposal for dealing with um, the congressionally established priority for the protection of religious freedom. They range from the dramatic to the very simple and ordinary. I'll list some of them uh, that are mentioned in the act. Diplomatic inquiries and protest, condemnation within international organizations, delay or canceling of cultural exchanges, and it goes on and on, uh, specifically in the statute. Even the threats of doing some of those things are sometimes quite effective. Sometimes even shining the spotlight of publicity is quite effective. So here's the question. How can political decision makers in the countries that pride themselves on their attachment to human rights, how can political decision makers be persuaded to speak out at least uh, and to act in the United States as Congress has directed them to do? Um, I think one of the most frustrating obstacles to that enterprise of trying to convince your government officials to do what they're directed by statute to do is that 
and I think this is a, is a valid criticism, one country speaking alone is almost always considered to be acting uh, for its own geopolitical motives. Its good faith is very easily questioned. So, um, and, and often with very good reason. So, are you ready for some good news? Uh, just a little bit of good news here after all that. And um, this is a truly encouraging development uh, that began almost exactly four years ago in London, where uh, parliamentarians from five different countries, at the invitation of Baroness Berridge, Elizabeth Berridge, who wished that she could be with us today, but is on her way to Ghana, uh, she invited parliamentarians who were concerned about religious freedom from four other countries and a group of us from USURF to come to London and uh, we met at the House of Lords and uh, we, uh, we discussed whether it would be possible to build a group of parliamentarians from more countries to join in an effort to speak with a unified voice. And uh, things moved very quickly from there. A couple of months later, this group, which had then grown to 30 parliamentarians from different countries, religiously diverse men and women, uh, they had expressed interest in such a group. And uh, the European Union provided a place, a meeting place, for us to have uh, a meeting in Brussels. And at the Brussels gathering, there was a capacity crowd interested in hearing uh, Baroness Barrage spoke, the then chairman of USERF, Katrina uh, Lanto Sweat spoke, Heiner Bielfeld, the UN Special Rapporteur for Religious Freedom spoke, and by November of that very same year, an organization was founded um, with a very long name, I'm only gonna say this once, the International Panel of Parliamentarians for Freedom of Religion or Belief. And there was a launching of that organization at the Nobel Peace Palace in Oslo. And that was attended by 30, all of whom signed a pledge to advance religious freedom in accordance with Article 18 of the Universal Declaration. All this is in the space of one year. Now it's three years after Oslo, and that group has 100 members from all over the world. And in its short life, it has led to the formations within the various countries of legislative caucuses for religious freedom. And it has led to several joint letters signed by parliamentarians from all over the world uh, addressing religious freedom issues in Pakistan, Myanmar, Indonesia, North Korea, and to the first of what ho one hopes will be a series of fact-finding visits. That network and its rapid growth was cited in USERF's 2018 report as, I quote, a real reason for optimism on an otherwise bleak international religious freedom landscape. Now it may not sound like much, but really it's an enormous leap to have been made in a space of only four years. And it gets past that problem of a single country, even if you can get officials to speak on their own, they're always going to be suspected of acting for their own geopolitical reasons. Now I'm on the second part of the talk, if you're keeping track. So, turning now to religious freedom in, what I, in the liberal democracies, the picture is less dramatic, of course, but nevertheless troubling. Few victims of religious discrimination have lost their lives, but many are losing their jobs and their ability to participate in public life while remaining true to their deepest beliefs. There's a folk song in the United States, a Depression-era song that goes, I've traveled the, whole, the wide world over and seen lots of funny men, some rob you with a six-gun and some with a fountain pen. So you have uh, a situation that is more subtle in uh, the liberal democracies, less severe, but uh, the violations and restrictions are increasing. And since you will soon be hearing very 
full analyses of the situation in the US and the UK from a remarkable group of experts. I am just going to paint with a very broad brush in this second section of the talk. So regard, when one says Europe, obviously there are great and significant differences from country to country. But we learn from the Pew Research Center that in Europe, both governmental restrictions and social hostilities are on the rise, with increases in social hostilities particularly directed at Muslims and Jews in some countries. It seems that fear of religiously motivated violence together with increasing secularization greatly complicates the task of defending religious freedom in Europe. I may be mistaken, and you can I ask you to correct me if I am, but it seems to me that there is less of a pushback against such measures as restrictions on the conscience rights of medical personnel who decline to perform euthanasia or abortions, uh, legal prohibitions of kosher and halal slaughter, bans on the conspicuous public display of symbols by government workers and students in public schools from place to place. In some places, uh, it is reported, again, please correct me if I am not getting good information here, that priests and ministers have been investigated simply for expressing traditional views on sexuality while preaching or in interviews. And with the legalization of same-sex marriage, it is only to be expected that there will be conflicts, increasing conflicts between the rights of individuals to be free of unjust discrimination on the basis of their sexual orientation on the one hand and on the conscience rights of groups and individuals who maintain traditional religious beliefs about sex and marriage on the other. Now I'm going to have a drink of water before I turn to the United States. So the situation in the US is similar in many respects, but there are some differences, maybe many, and you'll mention some that I gloss over here, but um, there are many differences that are worth noting. Um, there are, of course, many instances, as in Europe, of denial of conscience protection, controversies involving rights of parents, growing conflict between religious freedom and claims based on non-discrimination norms, abortion rights, and various sexual liberties. And as in Europe, there is a waning consensus on the importance of religious freedom, plus a good deal of open hostility to religion among opinion leaders in the media, the academies, the entertainment world. All that is nothing new. Uh, somewhat new is um, the uh, little group of scholars who are now maintaining um, in prestigious American law schools that religious freedom is an unnecessary right, that it's a redundant right, that everything that's important is already covered by constitutional protection of speech, expression, association. Uh, in fact, one constitutional scholar has gone so far as to unilaterally proclaim that the culture wars are over and uh, he says, the only question now is how to treat the losers, which he identifies as Christians and conservatives. And this scholar recommends, quote, take a hard line, you lost, live with it, rather than trying to reach any form of accommodation, remarking that the hard line seemed to work reasonably well with the defeated Nazis in Germany after World War II. Um, regret to say that's one of my colleagues. Uh, <laughs> Um, it is regrettable that many of the same culture warriors who once called for a policy of toleration and live and let live are now wanting to run their opponents out of their jobs, close down their businesses, undermine their institutions. A few years ago, the prevalence of those attitudes uh, seemed to be confined to the universities and a writer for commentary magazine quipped that uh, the, the universities in America are like little islands of intolerance in a great sea of freedom. But, 
but the uh, sea of the waters of the Sea of Freedom are not as tranquil as they once were. They're getting a little choppy these days. And just how choppy, I'll just give you one example, but uh, the uh, outgoing chair of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights uh, introduced their commission's annual report with a speech in which he said, I'm going to quote him here, religious freedom and religious liberty are simply code words for discrimination, intolerance, racism, sexism, homophobia, or any other form of intolerance. Repeated himself there, but we won't dwell on that. Um, this is a man who chaired a commission charged under U.S. statute, Civil Rights Act of 1964, and protecting people who are victims of religious discrimination. But uh, this is an example of uh, the situation in the United States. But again, I am going to say, and subject to correction, that there seems to be more popular resistance in the United States to incursions on religious freedom than at least I read about uh, in Europe from my distance. And if so, that might be explainable in part by some recent studies, very recent studies, on American religiosity. So here's a report issued by the Pew Forum last month. I find this a little surprising, but here's what Pew says. 56% um, of Americans say they believe in God as described in the Bible. Now, you may recall at the beginning of this talk, 56 of Americans said that religious freedom was not under threat. I, I don't know. We need to look at those figures. And, uh, but there's another brand new set of figures that is very interesting. Um, some researchers at Harvard and Indiana universities did a deep dive into the data on religiosity in the U.S. And what they discovered was that... Well, there is, as there is everywhere in the West, a rise in the unaffiliated and the no religion. Uh, the respondents who say that they are re religiously affiliated, 60% of those say that they are strongly affiliated. And that, I'm sorry, not 60%, 47% say they are strongly affiliated. And that is a rise from 39% in 1989. So in other words, the proportion of the population that self-identifies as religious has become more intensely so. And the researchers at Harvard and Indiana concluded that in this respect, the US is becoming more exceptional in comparison with other liberal democracies. So, part three, turning now to the challenge of making the case for religious freedom in this uh, very difficult environment, I think we can say that the fact, given that growing numbers of persons in Western societies describe themselves as unaffiliated or not religious, it would be surprising, would it not, if concern for religious freedom had not diminished. After all, the more that people see religion as uh, something like a hobby or as something that is private and solitary, the greater the likelihood that their concern about full, robust religious freedom, as outlined in UDHR Article 18, is going to diminish. Um, Recently, I was uh, talking to a colleague who asked me what I was working on, and I said, well, I'm getting ready to give this speech for Nigel Bigger and John Witte, and it's on religious freedom. And my colleague said, never got that issue. I just don't understand it. And this is not, I'm sure you know people like this. Um, there are more people like that than there are militant secularists, and they are far more influential than militant secularists. So uh, the less that one feels that he or she is personally affected by religious discrimination or persecution, the less interest one is likely to take in its protection. I think this is perfectly natural. It's to be expected. So I would like to use the remainder of this talk to mention just a few ideas that 
I think might be potentially useful in making the case for religious freedom. But as I said at the beginning, I am at sea here and I would really like to, I'm, I'm hoping to hear uh, great ideas from other people that will help us all with this. So I have no magic formula to suggest, but my hope is that we can exchange some further thoughts about these topics. So my first suggestion is one that every lawyer knows and uh, every evangelist in St. Paul knows, which is know your audience. There is no one line of discussion that is going to reach every kind of listener. So um, that's a simple one-liner. The second, I would say, more people are won over by concrete examples, personal stories, illustrative stories, than by formal argument. And I don't mean to say that there is no place for a rigorous theoretical defense of religious freedom. And in fact, uh, the current chairman of USERF, Daniel Mark, made a really impressive statement, I think, in the group's 2018 report. It's brief. I'd like to read it because I think he very concisely expresses uh, what someone with his philosophical and theological background would say. He says, Though freedom of religion is profoundly intertwined with other basic rights, such as freedom of expression and association, it stands out as the right for which people are most willing to suffer and die. This is because religious freedom safeguards the rights to recognize what is most sacred and to live one's life according to one's sacred obligations. Moreover, says Mark, religious freedom is the ultimate bulwark against totalitarianism because it stands as a testament to the notion that the human being does not belong to the state and that the person's highest commitments lie beyond the control of government. Now that's an impressive statement, but many people, I believe, would be much more apt to be swayed by a first-hand experience or a compelling story. Recently, I read a memoir by a British surgeon who uh, said that he had made a visit to a friend of his who was in a nursing home. And uh, he was dreading the visit because he uh, had had some experience with nursing homes and he thought that this was going to be a very sad visit. Instead, he found his friend um, happy, well cared for, attentively cared for, and he says he was quite surprised. I was quite surprised until I realized that this institution was run by a religious group. Well, he suddenly became aware of the difference that faith can make in performing some kinds of services that are not pleasant to perform always. Um, I do not want to exaggerate um, the degree to which faith-based institutions can perform better uh, in terms of humanity and efficiency and effectiveness, but when they do what they do well, it's just a step from observing what they do to understanding that they need the freedom to be true to themselves while they are doing what they feel called to do. Okay, a third possible suggestion. Sometimes what um, to us lawyers, especially something that sounds like a problem in theory, actually turns out not to be a problem at all in practice. And um, I would uh, give as an example here, it's often contended in the United States, uh, you may have heard that we're a litigious country. Uh, I always say that you can't blame a whole profession for the misdeeds of 500,000 of its members. But, uh, but we, we do have contingent fees and uh, other things that uh, do encourage litigation. And um, so uh, it's often said that if you give religious exemptions to from to religious people from generally applicable laws, that that will initiate a flood of litigation. Now, fortunately, we have quite, we have some very good studies and the evidence is uh, accumulating that in fact, 
the long American experience with religious exemptions has probably had the opposite effect. It certainly hasn't led to a flood of litigation. And it seems to be, uh, when I say long experience, I mean really long experience. Uh, you know, there was a certain war, um, I hate to mention it, but in 1776 there was this uh, difficulty between our countries. And George Washington really needed soldiers. He was desperate. And at the times when he was most desperate for soldiers, he nevertheless granted the Quakers exemption from military service. Uh, so uh, that tradition goes back a long way. And here's the thing from a, a legal point of view. Uh, when core freedoms collide, and they do collide more and more because as rights proliferate, there are more conflicts among rights, when core freedoms collide, a way has to be found to let each one have as much play as possible and not to permit either of them, if there are only two, to be read out of the canon. The Germans have an expression for that sort of accommodation. They call it praktische concordance. And it's really the great art. It's one of the good things that lawyers do is uh, figure out compromises, ways to get the maximum benefit out of whichever right is in play and in collision. And that's with, with increasing numbers of collisions in our complex society, that's a skill that should be very highly valued. Um, so the long US tradition of accommodating conscientious objectors um, accords very well with two pretty widely shared American ideals. These ideals, of course, are just that. They're ideals, and we uh, centers have not always lived up to the ideal. But uh, one is that a heterogeneous society like ours is better and richer for its heterogeneity and for its re religious differences and for its cultural differences. And the second is the respect for individual liberty, which demands that the state should not force people to violate their most deeply held beliefs without a very good reason. No rights are unlimited, right? People read, sometimes people read the Universal Declaration of Human Rights like a list. It's not a list. It's a document with a structure, with mutually conditioning parts. And so all the rights in the Universal Declaration are conditioned and subject to Article 29, which says these rights can be limited in view of the rights of others. This is what I've been talking about, praktische concurrence. OK, so um, now I have to mention two. Very, we're in a difficult area here. And these are problems that make uh, those of us who would like to defend accommodations and exemptions quite difficult. One of them is that is the concept of freedom that many people have in their minds. So that uh, when you talk about religious freedom, they're plugging in uh, chapter two of John Stuart Mill's essay on liberty. They're thinking of removal of constraints for the purpose of individual fulfillment. Nothing wrong with that, but religious freedom is a little different. People who seek religious freedom, at least many people who seek religious freedom, want to do so in order to fulfill their religious obligations. And so they want to have religious liberty in order to be true to themselves while fulfilling what they believe they are called to do. So Yuval Levin, has, who was on the US Bioethics Council, put it well, he said, religious liberty is not a freedom to do what you want, but a freedom to do what you must. It describes a duty of society to retreat and give its members space to act on what they deem essential. An acknowledgment not of a human liberty or right, but of a human obligation that precedes the social obligation and shapes it. Second problem, there's a view held by many in the human rights community, which ought to be 
uh, a community that embraces religious freedom. But there's a view held in the human rights community that uh, some persons and groups who seek protection for religious liberty do not deserve it. Uh, you'll hear more about this, I'm sure, from Richard Garnett, who will be speaking tomorrow. Um, many in the human rights community tend to see some religious persons and groups as antagonists to their causes. So those two obstacles are very difficult. Um, what, what do we do when we are dealing with people who in good faith have these beliefs that religious freedom, A, is not very important, or B, religious freedom is actually a code word for all kinds of bad things. Uh, one approach, I'm going to give you two examples uh, of an approach that can work, I think, under certain conditions. Um, and basically, I'm going to give you one example from the United States and one example from Europe, and then we can have dinner. Uh, so. Um, the first example from the United States, a very impressive example of an approach which calls liberalism to its own ideals of fairness to all, tolerance, the golden rule, basically. And a very impressive example in the United States of that approach was an op-ed co-authored by Stanford professor Michael McConnell with the former dean of Harvard Law School, Martha Minow, and it was written on the very eve of the Supreme Court's decision in the same-sex marriage case. Nobody knew how that decision was going to come down, and tensions were running very high, and these two academics on opposite sides of the issue got together and joined in deploring the trend toward ill will and demonization in conflicts over the role of religion and religious views in healthcare, marriage, and public life. No matter who wins or loses, they wrote, the biggest losers are the entire nation if we descend into intolerance. They acknowledged that no matter which way the decision went, it would pose challenges especially in, quote, finding the lines between assured protection for one's own freedom and equality on the one hand and interference with the religion, religious freedom and equality of others. But these two academics asked for an approach that preserves what they call the remarkable American promise to welcome people of all religions and to be a model on how to be both religiously vibrant and mutually respectful. And to that end, they jointly endorsed the principle that religious and other conscientious dissenters from legal and cultural norms should be accommodated when practical to do so. They also evoked what they called the admirable American progress of respect for dissent. The key to this promise, they said, its secret sauce is our ability to agree to disagree even about matters of profound importance both by accepting legal resolutions of intense disagreement while preserving avenues for ongoing dissent. Now, when the actual decision came down, Justice Anthony Kennedy, in writing for a five to four majority, seemed to be encouraging that sort of approach when he wrote, quote, many who deem same-sex marriage to be wrong reach that conclusion based on decent and honorable religious or philosophical premises, and neither they nor their beliefs are disparaged here in the Supreme Court. Toward the end of his opinion, Kennedy added, quote, it must be emphasized that religions and those who adhere to religious doctrines may continue to advocate with utmost sincere conviction that by divine precepts, same-sex marriage should not be condoned. The First Amendment ensures that religious organizations and persons are given proper protection as they seek to teach the principles that are so fulfilling and central to their lives and faiths and to their own deep aspirations to continue the family structure they have long revered. So that's an approach trying to appeal to uh, a very high-minded view of 
American tradition. I think, you know, it's high-minded view in the sense I think it's hortatory. It's trying to bring into being what it's describing as existing, and it remains to be seen whether it will um, hold or take hold. Now, the European example I'm going to give you was successful in doing a similar thing. It was successful in the European Court of Human Rights. Um, this involved what has come to be known as the Italian crucifix case. Uh, Italy was taken into the European Court of Human Rights uh, because it uh, mandated or maybe just permitted crucifixes in uh, public school classrooms. And a lawyer for several countries who were Amici Curiae, Joseph Weiler of New York University, an observant Jewish man, argued the case for those countries who were supporting Italy and the crucifixes in the classroom. Um, just as McConnell and Minow called upon an exalting image of American uh, pluralism, Weiler offered the court a very high-minded image of European pluralism. And I think his argument, I'm going to read the, the gist of his argument to you, I think his argument is a masterpiece of rhetoric. Uh, and you have to imagine, uh, you know, in, in Plato's dialogues, they, they say that uh, there's this incarnate meaning where the persona of Socrates carries the meaning. You sort of want to believe it because you believe in Socrates. So imagine Joseph Weiler standing there, uh, European emigre to the United States uh, you know, from a uh, troubled country, and wearing his yarmulke, and this is what he says. Europe is special in that it grant, guarantees at the private level both freedom of religion and freedom from religion, but does not force its various peoples to disown in its public spaces what for many is an important part of the history and identity of their states, a part recognized even by those who do not share the same religion or any religion at all. And of course, there you're looking at the speaker, who obviously is one of those who doesn't share the religion. Um, he says, it is this special combination of private and public liberties reflecting a particular spirit of tolerance, which explains how in countries such as, say, Britain or Denmark, to give but two examples where there is an established state church, Catholics, Jews, Muslims, and of course, the many citizens who profess no religious faith can be entirely at home, play a full role in public life, including the holding of the highest office, and feel it is their country, no less than anyone else's. It is an important model for the world of which Europe can be justly proud." End quote. What's important, Weiler went on to emphasize, is not whether a country like Italy permits religious symbols in the classroom, or a country like France forbids them. What is important, he said, is that the prohibition of religious symbols should not be understood as a denigration of religion or religious people. And the requirement of a religious symbol, such as the cross, should not be understood as denigrating other religions or those who do not profess a religious faith at all. Now, of course, there's a weak spot in the arguments of McConnell, Milo, uh, Minow, and Weiler, as I've already mentioned, they presuppose a certain respect for the ideals of fairness, tolerance, and pluralism. Uh, they either presuppose it or they're trying to wish it into being. In my view, Weiler's most important point was his acknowledgment that the form of pluralism he was holding up, that that form of pluralism could only work if supported by a culture of mutual respect and genuine tolerance. So I'm going to conclude with a very brief reflection on precisely that thought. We lawyers tend to assume, I think we sometimes fool ourselves into thinking that uh, 
our uh, efforts either in legislatures or in courts can carry the day that you really win something if you win a lawsuit or if you get a law passed or you beat back an administrative regulation. But um, the fact is, we need a little humility here, that the preservation of religious freedom ultimately depends, as Weiler says, on building cultural support. And most of the time, what we lawyers are doing, if we win cases or get statutes passed or uh, find a way to improve administrative regulations, most of what we're doing is helping to create space by time for the more important enterprise of culture building. The challenge is cultural before it is legal and political. Now, I'm afraid, like the little old lady who confessed the sin that she committed 40 years ago, I'm now going to have to repeat something that I have said before. And some of you have heard me say before. But uh, after many years as a teacher, uh, I, I find that belaboring the obvious isn't bad. I tell my students, I'm going to belabor the obvious. Just get ready for it, because uh, I find that uh, if you say something, it, just there's, some, there's some learning about this, that you have to say something to a student. How many times? 17? <laughs> I don't know. So anyway, I, I have said this before, but um, I do believe, I still believe, that uh, whether religious freedom will continue to be under threat or whether it will come to be respected as the fundamental human right that it is, I think much will depend on religious groups, religious leaders, and religious individuals themselves, whether this cultural challenge can be met. Theirs is the responsibility to encourage their co-religionists to the responsible exercise of religious freedom. Theirs is the responsibility to reject ideologies that would use religion as a pretext for violence. And theirs is the responsibility to find resources within their own traditions for promoting respect and tolerance. And at the same time, much will depend on whether the human rights community can accept that human rights, including religious freedom, are indeed as the Vienna Declaration said, and that as is implicit in the UDHR itself, human rights are universal, inalienable, indivisible, and interrelated. Those are weighty challenges. But your presence here and your patience through this lecture give me some hope that the challenges are not insuperable. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Glennon, for a sterling talk and a wonderful start to what will be a full three days of conversation. She has mapped out a lot of the hard issues based on her own experience and scholarship. She has laid some challenges before us that we need to engage already now. Uh, and we have an opportunity for a few minutes before dinner uh, to put some questions to Professor Glendon. Uh, I ask you to uh, wait till the microphone comes to you so we can get you on film and chase you down if necessary if you go on too long. Um, but if you do have questions, please uh, be respectful, be pithy, uh, and be powerful in your questions to Professor Glennon. The floor is open. Please signal so I can have my colleague tempt you with a microphone. Right over here, Professor Trigg. And perhaps you can identify yourself in your home institution as well, just for the record. Well, I'm Roger Trigg, and I'm based here in Oxford now. I'm an emeritus professor from Warwick, too. Um, uh, it isn't just American officials, of course, who have been rather complacent about religious freedom. I get very concerned about the attitude of the British government, particularly to genocide in the Middle East. 
Um, the Foreign Office set up an advisory committee, of which I was a member, and it only lasted two years and then got shut down by the present government and merged with a wider human rights body. And I think that tends to show how little concern there is for religious freedom at a time when people, as you said, are being killed in the Middle East precisely because of their religion, and, of course, very often precisely because they're Christian. And that's another thing I find the British government are very reluctant to identify Christians as being in particular need, even when they are in need, they say, oh, it's discrimination. So when churches, for example, want to help mm -hmm. refugees from Syria, uh, they can't say what well, we'd like the, the Christians because they're particularly suffering. They don't, very often don't even get to the refugee camps. Um, uh, but they're told, no, that's discriminatory, and just take uh, the people who are given. So there seems to be a lack of appreciation of the plight of many of the people. And I really don't know what can be done about it. <laughs> This, this is precisely, can, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Uh, this is precisely why uh, I put so much emphasis on what might seem to be a little thing, this uh, inter-parliamentary group with now 100 members. Because um, when one government speaks alone, even if you could get them to do it, very often, uh, the way I put it uh, in the talk was the government will be suspected of acting for ge geopolitical motives. But it, to, in fairness to the governments, very often they are afraid to act alone because they are afraid of stimulating incidents on their own soil and all kinds of, I mean, that would be the high-minded, but uh, in all kinds of baser political motives. Uh, very. Seldom does anyone do anything for a single motive. So uh, I do think it's very, it's a hopeful sign if you get a group of a hundred parliamentarians from a hundred different countries. It is a step in overcoming that problem that you so rightly describe as being not just the problem of the United States, although we're big so we get noticed more. <laughs> uh, but uh, it is a pervasive problem, and I think that's why the hundred with more every month are, are trying this other approach. Thank you. Um, Mark Emerson, PhD candidate in non-religion at Cardiff University and a judge in my day job. Um, I had a quick question about the interesting example you gave in the case of Lanxi, the, the crucifix in the classroom in the, in the Strasbourg court. Um, and a question about possible other interpretations, notwithstanding the highly persuasive um, silver tongue of Joe Weimer. Um, the two of the other issues that seem to crop up, firstly, the Strasbourg court's um, idea of margin of appreciation, it won't interfere with the setup in member state countries. But is it also making the point that there's a particular issue between a majority religion who's associated culturally with the history of a country and a minority religion which isn't? And so judgments would say it's okay in Italy to have a crucifix in a classroom. The dynamic is perhaps slightly different when it's minority religions, typically Muslim, seeking to manifest their religion, which perhaps don't have the same legal protection. No doubt about it, but uh, I, I think where Joseph uh, implicitly addressed your point is when he said, of course, this will only work if certain conditions are met. And among it, he was very wise not to go into what all those conditions, under the circumstances of that case, to go into what all those conditions would be. But certainly one of them would be uh, what I mentioned at the end, that religious groups do somehow have to find resources within their own traditions to uh, live in a society of fairness, tolerance, golden rule. Professor Durham. So you talked about the developments with the IPP on the parliamentary front. I think one of the interesting parallel developments is the first contact group uh, consisting of people from offices like the 
Ambassador at Large Office in the United States, the new German office that was uh, approved a couple of in the last week or two, the Danish office, uh, and uh, ups and downs of the Canadian office. Uh, I, my question is, from your experience, there, there are different things that people in the parliamentary setting and in the executive branch can do. Uh, do you have ideas of how they can work together, how they can complement each other, uh, what's, what's most effective, etc.? One thing that troubles me is that in this 20-year period of the congressional priority for religious freedom in foreign policy, we've had some administrations that were friendly to religious freedom and other administrations that were not particularly friendly to religious freedom when the State Department seems to have marched to its own drum right through. <laughs> and there, uh, I guess it comes back to culture again. Uh, the State Department has its own culture. Bureaucracy, well, let me kind of hang it all on the State Department, as uh, Max Weber taught us. Bureaucracies have their own culture. And uh, that culture can put up quite a resistance to an administration of either political party. Do I have an idea about how that could be fixed? Not right offhand. I mean, the ideas that come to mind might be draconian. <laughs> I wouldn't remember that. <laughs> uh, now, I don't know. How do you change the culture of the State Department? I, they're, they're, it's a complicated thing. But I think that's where the problem is. So that's why I keep coming back to the international group. It's a workaround. And there are other reasons why it's a good workaround. Because nobody would ever believe that the United States was acting solely out of concern for religious freedom, even if you did get the State Department and the administration to work together. And by the way, countries have to take geopolitical concerns into consideration. It's just that uh, we've done so little with international religious freedom. And we had so many opportunities where even shining the spotlight of publicity would have helped a great deal. Question back. Hi, I'm Justin Denny. Uh, so it seems that uh, religious freedom advocates are in many ways working with their hands tied behind their backs until the courts can recognize that secularism is its own set of religious beliefs. Uh, so it's secularism and secular beliefs on, on sexuality, on what goes on in public schools, is able to kind of fly under the radar under detection of the establishment clause because they say they're religiously neutral. But it's actually making competing religious claims about sexuality and what you can teach people in the schools. I know that Justice Potter Stewart in the 1950s, I believe, made that argument in one of his dissents. But I haven't really seen many people make that argument, even though I think it's really important uh, to limiting how uh, secularism is infringing upon the free exercise clause. Uh, so do you think, one, uh, do you think that's a problem? And two, do you think there's any hope to make that argument persuasively in the courts in, in America? Uh, yes, I do think it's a problem. And uh, you will see the argument made uh, quite eloquently in some of the academic literature. <clears throat> you won't see it made in the courts because uh, religious freedom advocates are trying to find the arguments that they think are most conducive to persuading at least five judges on the Supreme Court. And they, I don't think most religious freedom advocates would see that. They might agree with that, but they might not see it as a winner. Um, people who argue before, I, I, I just came across this data, which I found fascinating. People who argue before the Supreme Court of the United States are astonishingly good at knowing exactly how to tailor their arguments to a very mixed 
uh, group of nine individuals. And uh, some researchers at an American university decided to uh, take all the cases that were pending in the Supreme Court in a particular term. They hadn't been decided yet. The Supreme Court generally decides about 70 cases. It's a nice job, nine people, 70 cases, not much work. Um, the, uh, it, so 70 cases, and uh, they asked um, a group of uh, appellate, people who specialize in appellate argument before the Supreme Court to predict the outcomes. And they asked a group of constitutional law professors at major law schools to predict the outcome. And then they fed all the data into a computer and asked the computer to predict the outcome. Now, which of those three do you think was most accurate? It was not the law professors. It was first, the Supreme Court advocates, second, the computer, <laughs> and third, the professors. Very sorry to have to report this, but... Uh, so, um, I, I think the answer to your question is that group of advocates is very aware of the point that you make, but that they don't see it as a winner. Lady back here, and then we'll take one more question over here. Last two. Please, Madam. Um, my name is Shweta. Uh, I come from the University of Reading, and I'm a first year PhD candidate, very, very new to the field, so I apologize if my question sounds very naive here. My question is in reference to one of the one of your concluding remarks that protection of religious freedom will now largely rely on religious groups, institutions, and individuals. Do you think this is a risky proposition in a setup like India, uh, especially with the kind of volatile governance we have there right now? For instance, the Modi government rejected the uh, USERF report in 2016 as an example of Western bias and hegemony against India. Um, I'm not sure that I... Uh, I'm, I'm so sorry, I'm not sure that I quite got, I, I understand that you were asking a question about uh, religious freedom in India, and uh, I guess I would have to say that I don't feel well qualified, it, it was not a country that I visited on USERF, and I, I don't feel well qualified to answer a specific question about India. I'm sorry. I have to say thank you. Does anybody in the house want to speak to the lady's question? Please, madam. My name is Ruby Shaw, and I'm a graduate student at Oxford. And to draw the parallel between the defense of religious freedom and the defense of free speech, I was wondering if maybe concentrating excessively on the formal arguments for either can detract from the cause because people listening on the opposite side will think, well, you still haven't answered the question of why these views that people are trying to express are valuable instead of bigoted, for example. So, to what extent do you think it would be more effective to actually just furnish the public with greater religious education to provide the positions on, let's say, marriage, life, etc., with both secular and religious arguments? Well, that's a tough question. And, um, you know, I, I, I wouldn't want to offer a general answer. I think uh, I'd almost say not even country by country or region by region, but community by community. The reason why I say that is that I'm from Massachusetts, but I am not from Boston, Massachusetts. I am from the far other end of the state where I grew up in a little town that was very much like the towns that Tocqueville visited. We had 5,000 people, which I guess uh, Aristotle said that was the ideal size for a whole town. And uh, it, it, we, we had uh, about half the town was Catholic, half the town was Protestant. We never, ever had the kinds of Catholic Protestant tensions that there were in Boston, where they burned down convents and there were riots. Uh, and so uh, it's almost that sort of thing almost has to be person to person. And I think that's one of the things that um, the Bible teaches too is that uh, just 
be what you are and who you are in your place, wherever you find yourself. And that in itself is education. The Bible is a fine way to end, I think. <laughs> It's a wonderful start to our conference. I think we should uh, have a robust round of applause for Professor Glenn.